Okay, we start with what we in the trade call an opening conceptualising piece. <laughs> Mum wore the trousers in our house. And what trousers? Vast buff land girl corduroys against which her buttocks strained with playful mystery. <laughs> like a gift-wrapped moon. <laughs> Dad channelled his displaced maleness elsewhere. At the top of our loft ladder, in the cobweb recesses of our attic, he, he built himself an empire. He fashioned a kingdom of papier-mâché hills and fuse-wire trees, of resin lakes and cardboard villages through which double-o-scale Hornby trains rattled his tiny dreams to destinations of the imagination. It was a calm kingdom, a law-abiding kingdom, and Dad held dominion from the control panel at the centre, wearing a second-hand station master's hat, running his fingers over the points and switches, feeling at their tips, here, if nowhere else, the electric hum of power. And on it went, day after day, week after week, month after month, those little trains always running dead on time beneath the endless summer sunset of a 40 watt Woolworths attic bulb. Until one day, one day something happened. Exactly what we never knew, perhaps a Friday night fight in one of the little cardboard pubs. Perhaps an act of indecency behind the clip together on the engine shed. <laughs> Whatever it was, the law-abiding tranquility had been shattered by an act of social deviance. And Dad's response was swift, and it was brutal. My brothers and I were summoned from downstairs to bear witness, and in Dad's eyes, learn something. And we stood huddled shoulder to shoulder, playing with ourselves and each other through our pyjama trousers for comfort. <laughs> <laughs> As Dad raged against his fallen Eden, with a swagger stick whittled from the thigh bone of a conscientious objector, he drove the tiny 176 scale plastic inhabitants from out of their tiny little houses, so they gathered in terrified huddles in streets and parks and village squares, as above them their god thundered in his heaven, a demented Benzedrine Gulliver waging war on the ungrateful little bastards of a Lilliput that had betrayed him. <laughs> And he swooped down his fingers, fat sausage fingers like sweaty zeppelins, and he scooped from amongst he scooped from amongst them when men even, women and children, those who he would make a bloody example of. And then he marched them, he marched them to the top of the nearest papier mache hill, and there with, without trial, without ceremony, and without mercy, he strung them up. He strung them up from fish wire nooses hanging from the fuse wire trees and then taking a packet of swan vestas from beneath his second hand station master's hat he struck a match which he held aloft where it blazed in the sky like a terrible comet before he swooped it down beneath the twitching crutch of one of his little plastic victims and with an evil hiss a curl of thick black smoke twisted upwards against the endless Pitiless sunset of that 40 watt attic bulb. And a terrible silence fell. And we all turned, prisoners of our thoughts, and returned from whence we'd come. The remaining villagers back to their sad little houses, and my brothers and I back downstairs. And in the womb of my bedroom, I wept. I wept and I, I wept and I wept and I wept and I wept for those, those little plastic victims and for victims of savage authority everywhere. And something in me died that night. A certain innocence was lost. And I turned to my little bedside shrine. 
And I took down the effigy of Valerie Singleton, which I'd made from wax and string and real human teeth. <laughs> and in my hot, angry hands, I remodeled it into an effigy of Mick Jones from The Clash. <laughs> and then I slept. I slept, and I slept, and I slept. And when I awoke, I was an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as I say, that's, that's what we call an opening conceptualising piece. <laughs> that helps bring in, introduce certain themes 